Hey, so if I may, I have one question. Yeah. Uh, where are you so from? Tell, me, tell me your name and where you're from, I guess, when you're starting. I'm Mateusz, uh, but it's easier to call me Matt, and I'm from Poland, Warsaw. Poland, all right, cool. Yes, yeah, so uh, the question is about inverted pyramid. When we uh, all, I was just going through the course and I was thinking about classifying every topic into base, uh, apex, or body. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if maybe the tool should somehow incorporate this data into deciding uh, what to write about. Because for now, I saw there is nothing in the in the functions, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, good question. Uh, that's one that I thought about. Um, if we should include that on the previous version of the search analysis tool, I felt like um, the weak link with it was it was just too time consuming to enter something in. You know, it was this brand plan and then it was lots of different columns. And then I found when I actually did search analysis, I would uh, just skip major chunks because it was too long, right? And so we really wanted to streamline. So that's one specifically that I considered putting on the tool itself. And then I realized like, well, actually, that's just a mental thing we want to think through to help us understand the search volume. Um, and so uh, it's, it's a step you should be thinking about, but really it's, it's represented on the sheet just in search volume. All right. Got it. Thank you very much. Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so I, from my understanding, if we see anything at all in trends, it's supposed to go in the five to 10,000 bucket, assuming we've done that thought through the pyramid and everything, right? And we're mm -hmm. supposed to do those both kind of consecutively, right? So if I see just like even a couple of tiny bumps in the graph or whatever, that goes, that's right, it goes into the five to 10,000. Or can I sometimes say like, okay, I wanna be more, a little more cautious, put it into the one to 5,000. What, what do you think about that? Well, I, if, if you're showing a graph in, in trends, I'd probably put it in the five to 10,000 bucket. Um, I, I've said this several several times, I guess, since it was launched, but I, I do just want to make sure I continually reiterate. I don't know if it was wise of me to give those to give those buckets numbers. I probably should have said very high, high, medium, low, right? Um, so it's not we don't need to worry about about the um, number so much. But if trends is showing anything at all, I'd put it in that five to ten thousand category because if it's real low, it just doesn't show anything. But, but the real trick with trends is, how do you know you're for sure searching the right thing, right? How do you know um, if you're for sure only getting what you should? So I'm gonna share my screen a little bit. And here's one I was looking at just this morning. Um, so I'm gonna go to trends.google.com. And um, the phrase I'm focusing on, and I'm gonna talk about this in the, a YouTube video on Tuesday is uh, what animals do hunters eat? So some search analysis, I was came across that like people say like, oh, hunters, they're just, you know, killing the animal, not eating it. What, which ones are they going to eat and stuff, right? So I look at this in Google Trends. And, and first of all, just when I see that search phrase, I say, yep, I want that one. It just feels like the, the kind of one that I think is going to work. And yet I put it into Google Trends and we get nothing, right? Um, and then I say, well, maybe it's not showing up with anything because this could be phrased quite a lot of different ways, right? Um, uh, what animals uh, or animals that hunters eat, right? Um, and we say, ah, shoot, it, it still isn't showing anything here. Um, animals wasted. Okay, now we at least see something. And so now we see, well, is the topic animals wasted? Is this really the same as what I'm as what I'm writing about? And I've got to say probably not. We could use the phrase animals wasted in a lot of different ways, right? Like uh, do lions eat their prey and then waste them, right? Like that could mean so many different things. And so that's the real trick with trends is just being uh, trying to figure out phrasing for it um, that is going to be informative for you, 
but without bringing in extraneous information. So this is a perfect example of where trends just frankly is not helping us, uh, right? It's this phrase of, you know, what animals do hunters eat? Trends just doesn't tip us off on if this is helpful. It, and so it's probably not in that five to 10,000 query, uh, query group. And yet it's one I definitely want to write about. In fact, um, Zoom puts this little bar across the top so I can't actually read what I'm doing. In fact, I start, oh, no, that's not it. Where are you? There it is. In fact, I started writing the post yesterday, what animals hunters do and don't eat. And so since I saw it was a little too small, um, it wasn't showing up on trends, I thought, well, how could I add a lot of <laughs> meat into this article that would make it the type of thing that would attract a lot of uh, a lot of searches? And so I kind of I thought through like what animals always what hunters what animals hunters always eat what they would usually eat and some that usually you're going to kill and not actually use the meat of and then why would you kill something and not use the meat of some of these things and so this kind of becomes a query group post that yes it exactly answers that particular query but there's a lot of meat in there oh this is getting bad um uh, and so you it it's i think this post is going to be great and so was tr google trends helpful well, actually, yes, but in a very different way than we thought. We said, you know, this is probably a little small. And so what could we do to make this a little bit more of a query group? But also remember that just because it's not on Google Trends doesn't mean you shouldn't write about it because most of that of the posts in that one to 5,000 category, ooh, those are, those are juicy, we want those. That's a good spot to be targeting and they won't show up in Trends. Still valuable though, to be able to shoot, search the little bit more broad things to see where, how far we do have to go before it shows up in trends and then realize, okay, I'm about a third of that. And so I'm probably there. We're still, we've got to use a lot of brain work. This isn't gonna absolve us of, 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 of our brains as we're doing this process. So just to kind of summarize, I just, um want to make sure I understand like for these that sweet spot of between 1000 and 5000 page views where Google Trends isn't going to give us necessarily a lot of data. Um, the, the concept is that we want to use um, we, want, we want to find tangential keywords and maybe group a lot of similar um, content that we feel like, you know, there's definitely something here and try to answer all those in one post. Well, in this case, yes. Uh, in this case, yes, because I, I am concerned that it could be a little bit small. But a lot of times we say, yeah, but you know what, as I'm searching, I just see this question popping up all the time. Maybe it's not to quite pop it, quite showing on trends, but I just feel like there's enough. That's okay with me. That's fine. You can go ahead and write that article. You're probably right. And it'll be in that one to $5,000 sweet spot. Um, but a way to give yourself a little assurance is by doing what I showed there, kind of turn this into a query group if you're a little bit nervous that it's that it's going to be too small. Just be nervous with, just be a little bit hesitant with the query group because remember that you can just all of a sudden turn a very specific answer into something that's just so broad and it's like, where are we going with this? Uh, so you do still have to stay on topic. Okay, Jeff asks in the, in the chat, he says, what if no graph, but one of the other boxes? Okay, if, if that happens, I'm gonna share my screen again, it's almost always that bottom left box that shows. If you're gonna get just one of the, oh, too many tabs here. Um, if you're gonna get any one of them, oh, let's see, uh, is Pete Mitt, a uh, Neanderthal. How do you spell Neanderthal? <laughs> Sorry, Pete Mitt. Uh, <laughs> actually, I thought it was really fun to see your face because I've seen you in the community for a long time. Um, uh, you're the first thing that I thought about. Okay, so uh, this bottom left box, if anything's going to show just one box, but it's not the graph, it's going to be this one. And I probably wouldn't count that at all for the 
uh, for this because this is just saying, hey, I know something related to this search, but these three boxes are saying, I don't know enough about this search, right? But this related topics can be super useful because let's say I do something like, uh, oh, um, chicken coop. Um, and if I see this, I say, well, that's great. Uh, there's, there's plenty of search volume here. That doesn't surprise anyone. But the real question is, what, what would be a good subset of this query? And that's gold right here. Look at the related topics. It's going to show you um, what some of those uh, related topics are. And then we see, huh, chain link fencing for a chicken coop. Um, chicken coop chain link. Aha, now this is interesting. Um, now we see that there may be something in the 5,000 range about ch using chain link fencing on chicken coops. But now I need to understand what, what that means. What is the searcher intent here? What kind of resource are they looking for? And so I'm just going to Google chicken coop chain link. And I see, okay, with images being the top thing here, they're looking for inspiration. They're thinking, hey, chicken coops, these things are complicated. Why don't I just put up a chain link fence and chuck them all in there, right? Um, and so a post, since we're seeing images here, a post like 21 um, inspiring images of chain link chicken coops, right? Gold, I'm writing it. Right, we got the, it was in Google Trends. It was a subset of something else. We see they want an image, bang, I'm ready to write. That's what we wanna see. That's a, that's a really cool article. Actually, I should save that example, kind of file that one away. That one sounds kinda, that one's kinda cool to see how that process goes. Um, okay, Karam says, can we use Keyword Planner um, he says, oh, average traffic as a second option. I wouldn't use Keyword Planner at all. So this is Google's, uh, Google's tool, um, and they are going to tell you, tell you the, the search volume, but it's for, um, they're trying to estimate how many ads displays for that term they could, there could be. And so it's not just the number of searches. It says it is, but it is not. And as we've checked, many, 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 many times to see how if we could use this tool in a useful way. They've just deprecated it so far because they don't want to give this data. It's just not, it's just not, you just shouldn't use it at all, really. It could be used for ideation, but just ignore the numbers, I guess, is what I'm saying. So should we use actually uh, uh, our own ideas and uh, thought process just to uh, come up with the next topics or related topics. Is that a better? Yeah, let me see if I understand what you mean. So uh, you're saying, should we just use our own brain to think of the categories to be putting things in? Yeah, and uh, just the related topics so we can uh, uh, kind of make up our own, um, how, to, how to say it? Um, to make it relatable with the other posts so we can intertwine them and link it in them. So. Yeah, kind of creating the different silos on the website. Yeah. Okay. Yes, um, I, I certainly certainly think you can. Now I did show, let's see, got to go back to sharing my screen. I did show in the course, it's one of the later lessons in kind of the advanced portion of search analysis that um, if you're going, oh, here it is. I got an Ahrefs tab open. So if you want to see um, those major categories, uh, I, in fact, this, it's already open right now. So I just went Ahrefs Keyword Explorer and I searched Mosin Nagant, which is a type of World War II rifle. Um, so I searched, let's say I'm gonna make a, an old military firearms website. I might say, well, Mosin Nagant is gonna be a huge category of this website. And I want to know what silos I should have uh, about Mosin Nagants. Well, there you go. It just tells you right here. It's breaking down Mosin Nagants into the major chunks 
of content here about Mosin and Nagants. And I can see in generally how big ammo is compared to articles about the caliber, etc. And this one's maybe we're a little bit too narrow. So maybe I'll take something like, uh, oh, uh, oh, we'll just search something too broad just to get just so that we can see a clear example that you're all familiar with. I'm just going to search dogs. Okay, so I'm going to go to parent topics. This is well, yeah, I'm going to nope, nope, nope. I like questions. Okay, here we go. So in uh, if I'm writing a site about dogs, man, we're gonna have a bunch of things about what can dogs eat, right? Um, Something about licking. We'll see. That there's that's a major con major piece of uh, content there. Grass, poop, etc. Now, will we make a poop silo? Well, most people would say no. Their categories are going to be things that we think we think breeds and uh, buying a dog yeah. and training a dog. We think in kind of categories like that. But I say like, man, if there's that much traffic about dog poop. Yeah, I'm going to make a silo about, you know, 20, 30 different articles about dog poop, right? Um, that actually could be great. Now, do I necessarily want poop as a category at the top of my website? No, we probably want to keep those normal things, uh, right? But would I plan 20 articles around dog poop? Yeah, I, I think that's actually a great, a great uh, silo of content to put. So I really like Ahrefs, this left-hand panel is so valuable for just getting a quick look at, uh, at animals. And then, oh, you see like, oh man, would I have thought about pregnant dogs as a silo? I'm not sure I would have, but oh, there it is. Uh, there's, it's actually a pretty, pretty significant chunk of all queries about dogs. Pregnancy is a big one. Yeah, so maybe not actually poop as the main article, but uh, like food in the, uh stuff that that relate to it yeah well i would write things like why is my dog's poop green why is my dog's poop runny uh, yeah, exactly you know how to get poop out of the yard how to keep dog poop from ruining the grass i mean there's just so many different things yeah thanks Pete Nitt says it's not a good search analysis webinar until we talk about dog poop and someone accuses you of being a Neanderthal. No, just kidding. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes when I'm writing these things, I don't know where it comes from. Um, okay, this reminds me of Steve Blank's startup manifesto rule. There are no facts inside the building, so get outside. Verify our assumptions. Okay. All right, any other questions? Hey, Jim, quick question. Yeah. Um, whenever I'm looking at Google Trends, and I do a search, whenever I'm doing, um, you know, put in a search term, um, whenever we have full trends data, I'm noticing underneath the related, uh, related queries, and you have rising and top, um, is, it, uh, is it a good idea to look through those and actually see? Because one thing I'm kind of noticing, if I click on those related queries, those queries seem to have things that are already in Google Trends, like Google Trends is already pulling data on those things, right? Mm -hmm. So is that, a, is that a good way to identify other potential uh, topics, you know, for, for content? Yeah, I think so, for sure. Uh, yeah, as far as the ideation side, I mean, everything's helpful, right? I mean, anywhere you get an idea, you might as well, um, because it's going to have to go through validation anyway. Right. Well, yeah, and I think more specifically, uh, which I wasn't clear about is because it's showing up as related queries, should that be considered as part of that main thing that you search for, or should those be separate topics or just depends on the size of the topic, I guess. Well, if it has, if, if you're searching a topic that's big enough that tiny pieces, subtopics of that topic have their own search query or their own trends data too, we're maybe too broad. We should maybe be just taking those subtopics. Okay, thanks. If, if as long as that subtopic really is a subset of the larger and not just a separate related query. 
Hi, um, I actually wanted to ask about the uh, battleship method. I'm going through it at the moment and I just wanted to know, should I be now using Google Trends to figure out my missed posts and whether to rewrite them or to just leave them? No, I wouldn't use Google Trends for that uh, because you have real data, right? Um, well, I, I, I guess I see what you're saying. I think I think I misunderstood. So you're saying if we have a missed po if we have a missed post and we say, okay, this just isn't bringing in the query. Well, the next question is going to be, what is your ranking position? If you're ranking number one, well, we already have all the data we need, right? We already know that this is too low. I rank number one, not bringing in hardly any traffic, and so this is just a miss, right? But if I, but if it's a missed post and I rank low, um, and then we say, is this worth writing? Uh, like, should I have won anyway, then yeah, sure. I think it'd be good to go through this process before we dive back in the ring. Um, yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Actually, I have one question about product reviews. Mm -hmm. So when I type the name of the product in the Google Trends, it shows complete data. But okay. the moment I type the review after the keyword, it shows up no data. So should I write the article? Well, I guess then the, qu the question is what percentage of the people searching that product are going to be looking for a review? And this is where we just got to kind of use our brains and, and guesstimate as best we can. So if our product is a, a two by four board, well, then we say very few people want a review of this, right? And we say, yeah, there's a lot of traffic about this, but people aren't searching for a review. If, however, the product is whatever, a Joby Gorilla Pod, and we say, well, it's not on Google Trends, but look, there are a ton of people searching about Gorilla Pods. I've got to think a lot of them want a review, and so I'm going to go ahead and write it. Okay. Uh, actually, I have one another question about sniping. Mm -hmm. So, what if we just do and uh, you copy the URL of a forum, form, and then paste it on Ahref and then see what their top pages are, and if we could find some really low competition topics. So, is it a good idea? Great idea. Okay, so. Um... I want to show you why I didn't include that in the course, um, but could still be a very valuable uh, technique. So um, I'm going to go to Site Explorer, and this is a this is this happened yesterday. So I'm going to search Predator Forum. Is that what it is, or Predator Forums? Got to make sure I'm searching the right thing. Oh, Predator Talk. That was it. Predator Talk. So this is one that I was wanting to go after yesterday. Um, and when I search Predator Talk, I'm, I'm going to go to Organic Search, go down to see what their top pages are. And so I'm going to now rank them by traffic and descending order. And this is a large forum in the niche that I'm going off of after. It, it's a big forum, years old, tons of content here. Well, uh, we're going to ignore the traffic number here. Um, but when I start looking at what their top pages are, the, I happen to know this product. It's a small product. Um, and so if that's one of their top pages, I'm concerned. Coyote hunting laws in Nebraska. This is geographically limited, just about the laws. Boy, I don't know. Um, just as I look through some of these, I think, dang, those aren't very big. I just, I, they can't be very big. And so this is a problem with the technique in general of trying to snipe a forum. The reasons that, that forums get so much traffic is generally be because they are an inch deep and a mile wide, right? They have, they have a zillion keywords that they're going after from you know thousands upon thousands of posts. 
but they're only going to rank for these very, very niche questions, right? And so sometimes you'll see a form that gets a big winner, right? They, they're ranking for something that actually is a good term. And so if you can find those, awesome. But just in a practical sense, as I've tried to snipe forums, it ends up that I look at it and I'm like, ah, oh, man, it's just, they're getting traffic by, by getting 10, 15 page views a month on a ton of different topics. And so it ends up not being a great snipe target. However, sometimes, you know, we all know, we do see those forms popping up for something that, wow, it's amazing that they do. And so it's great if you do find those, but I just, I don't know if I'd go all in on that strategy um, because of that same issue. Just in a practical sense, when I've actually tried it, it's not, it's not working very reliably uh, to find the good stuff. Hey, Jim. I, I actually Good found a great winner. You. That's why I included that. Okay. All right. Sorry. Who was next? Sorry. Somebody was just talking. Okay. Okay, uh, Pete Mitt says, um, in your personal search analysis, how important is it to you that you separate your ideation from the competition analysis? Uh, I find myself checking competition as I go. You know, I don't know that it's necessarily a bad habit to do. I like it when I do them separately. And I think the reason I like it separate is because sometimes I find something and I get excited about it when I first find it. Uh, and I kind of find myself trying to force it. And then as I go through the competition analysis, okay, not really. And so I find that if I can uh, find the topics, just let them sit and my mind can calm down. And then I come back to the competition analysis and I'm just a little bit more critical, a little scrutinize a little bit more some of those ideas that I found. So I like to separate separate it, but I mean, either way is going to work just fine. Uh, so Mark Daniel says, so we're not supposed to size the competition anymore before writing an article? Oh, definitely not. You absolutely should size the competition. Uh, just that we're already going to be doing that in the search analysis process. I mean, it, it's going to have primary search query and then the search volume and then bang, you got to decide competition. It won't even allow you to, to move on and decide if it's a response or staple post until you've decided the competition. So we absolutely need to be doing that. Quick question, Jim. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually uh, come across this uh, problem with when I'm doing the search analysis. So sometimes, for example, uh, if I write the question uh, in the search analysis sheet, uh, Boy, I just forgot the question. I'll come back to that, sorry. That's okay. That's all right, Jim, lots of people on here. Yeah. Another question for you. Um, when analyzing the competition, um, whenever you have a search term, um, let's say like how long to grill a steak, right? Mm -hmm. So you have something that's very specific and you know, you're know you measuring different dunnesses or whatever else, but whenever you throw that into a, uh, you know, into a, a search query like on Google, you see a lot of recipes and as, com as components of that is the cooking time, right? Is that something that you take into a consideration whenever you're doing the competition? Like, would you classify that as a higher competition with a lot of these big sites or is that low competition? Cause it's not quite on point with what the actual term is. Very good question. So tell me again, what the query was something, what was it about a steak? Uh, yeah, like how long to grill a steak. Okay, so let's look at that specifically. Okay. Um, okay. And you know, I, I get what you're saying. It's just an example here. Okay. Um, so let's say we see a bunch of, a bunch of recipes here, you know, how to grill the best steak. Well, simply recipes, large, large, large website. Um, so that's an issue um, because it's a large site, but is that what I searched? No, it's not actually what I searched. Now, sometimes, you can go through this and you say, <laughs> excuse me, sometimes you go through this and you say, well, that means people's needs aren't being met. 
that that's Google's, they, they love that phrase. They've been talking about needs met, like uh, in every webinar, that's all they talk about anymore. Um, is, uh, you know, is, is a searcher's, are a searcher's needs being met? And so sometimes we say, no, the needs aren't being met. It's just throwing up a bunch of stuff and not actually helping it. But Google's also really good at finding the searcher intent. And so often I find if it's showing something that's a little bit different from what you'd expect, it's just because that's what they want. And an example of that is the reviews question. So if I search um, Joby Gorilla Pod reviews, often you know the number one search result is amazon.com and it's just the product list listing for Joby and then target.com and it's the product listing for, for it and Best Buy, et cetera. And so it could be easy for a, a newer, uh, somebody newer at this to say, people's needs aren't being met. There are no reviews of the Joby Gorilla Pod. Well, that's obviously not true. It's just that Google's saying, you know, when people are searching this, if I just give them the Amazon listing, they're actually just happier. And so we're just going to do that. And so that could be the same case. In fact, I'm almost sure it is in this specific, in this specific case that um, a recipe does have the information in there. And so they come asking for how long to grill a steak and they say, oh, here's this recipe. I'm just going to look at the cook time um, and it's going to help me out even more because now it's the whole recipe. And so in this case, I would say it's probably not a good signal. I, I would not write that. Josh. In contribution to, that, uh, to the response that he just gave, uh, sometimes when you're searching for a query, uh, you know, you, it's actually in, uh, it's a searcher intent query. It's not really a buyer intent query. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that case as well, you come across these Amazon listings. And so how do you gauge competition in that scenario? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of specific to each use. It, it's, it's something we just have to analyze are needs being met or is there a reason that Google is just taking me to, to the listing? Um, and one way that can help to know that is to just scroll down. Let's look at page two um, of the search results. That's the best place to hide a dead body, by the way, because nobody's ever going to find it. But if you actually click on page two of the search results um, and we start seeing articles that are on point, but we're being buried by the other stuff, then we know, aha, yeah, Google really just, they're, they're happy showing something that's not directly what they search for, but is a bigger site that has the information somewhere on it. Got it. And also in the tool that you have uh, shared with us in the new search analysis course, uh, one of the, you know, the drop downs actually suggests if there is a Wikipedia result on the search uh, SERP, then basically it's very high competition how often is that true? Because I've, uh, I mean, one of the sites that I have, I've actually come across results where some of my articles have been able to outrank Wikipedia, but also there were really nothing else out there. But if it's a slightly bigger niche, uh, I mean, how, how do you, do you think it's always the case or do you think it's sometimes it's true and sometimes it's not? I, sometimes true, sometimes not. And I'll give you an example. So if we just go back to Mosin Nagant, I, I mean, like really, I just, I guarantee Wikipedia will be maybe not at the top, but it's going to be close, right? And okay, look, there we go. Wikipedia right at the top for something like this. So when you're looking for, for generalized information, you know, the Mosin Nagant, it's a historic rifle. Um, it's, you know, history. It's a general topic. It's just, man, that just screams Wikipedia, right? It just, Man, Wikipedia, that's exactly what it's built for. But if, however, I were to search, um, are some Mosin Nagants a different caliber than 7.62 by 54R? Um, I mean, I have no idea. Uh, but if, if we saw Wikipedia showing up here, um, and it was just one line from the Wikipedia article, then I'm all in. Let's go destroy them, right? Uh, because we can have a much more in-depth thing than, than just that sentence. Oh, and look, Wikipedia is down here. It's the second result, right? <laughs> um, so I would feel just fine going after that for this type of query, but for like the general topic of it, uh, you're probably just not going to beat it. Hey. I had a question for you, Jim. Oh, sorry. 
Hey, I'm new, uh, super excited. Um, in my search results, I keep seeing like a specific, very large topic in the related searches. How can I break that down into smaller ones? It comes up in many of the small searches that I do is a very specific, like how to change something in a specific app or, or a very specific thing. And it keeps coming up and I don't really know how to interpret that. Okay, so the best way to, to break something into a smaller piece is, you know, let's say how to change my iPhone background. And so we see, oh boy, there's no way I'm going to write about this when support.apple.com has very clear instructions. Just forget it. They are like, they are going to win, right? And then WikiHow has an article on it and Business Insider, forget this. But we say, okay, is there a piece of this I could take? Um, and so I'm going to look at related searches. I don't, oh yeah, there's also a people also ask. I'm going to look at this first. We can't, we can't see your screen. Oh, sorry. It's not nearly as exciting when you just got to look at my mug. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm going to look at people also ask. I'm going to look at related searches here. That's going to help me break it down. Um, I could also go to Google Trends at that bottom left uh, thing. I could go to Ahrefs and I could go into the Keyword Explorer. Remember that left panel there when we're in Keyword Explorer. Um, so there are a lot of different places. And then maybe I see something like uh, how to use a landscape photo for your iPhone background. And now, aha, maybe that's something I can write about. Thanks. Mm-hmm. I got a question for you, Jim. Yeah. Um, I, one thing I'm having trouble wrapping my head around is with competition analysis. I feel like previously in the, in the previous Hey, course, what John is this? This is uh, Dirt Bike Planet, John. Oh, hey, all right. I wondered. I thought I recognized your voice. Hey, how are you, man? Good. Good. Hey, I apologize, uh, kids crying in the background. I'm doing dad duty today. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, on previous competition analysis, I feel like we went into each article that popped up and gauged how many words they were, how well it covered it. I feel like currently what we have going on, sorry, I got kids on, <laughs> it's distracting me, um, is you kind of look at if the sites are major, um, if they're big players. And I, I didn't see a lot in the video when you were doing competition analysis in the course of you going in and checking to see how well it's covered by that big brand, for example. Um, I'm, I'm gonna mute my, my microphone while you get the answer. You're good. Uh, yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, I think the, the re well, I'll tell you the reason I cut it out. The, the reason I didn't want to include that is it takes too long, number one. <laughs> and I'm trying to move everything. In the previous version of the course, I felt like we were really dumbing a lot of things down to make it really, really simple for beginners. But then when I sat down to actually do stuff, I skipped a lot of steps that I just didn't feel were necessary, I could kind of move over. In the new version of the course, we, we've kind of realized like, you're all smart people, it's gonna take some training, but we're gonna teach you the way that we exactly do it. No extra steps to try to dumb it down, right? And so usually like, if I see the title of an article and it's from a major site, I've got a good idea that it's probably a reasonably good article, right? Now, would it, before I actually sit down to start writing my own article, would I go see how other people helped searchers with this query and get some ideas of what worked, what was good, what was effective in their teaching, in their writing? Well, sure, I, I would definitely do that. In fact, I, I don't think I'd ever actually start typing an article without going and quickly browsing through a couple articles. But just as we're quickly doing the search analysis, I'm just gonna see if they're a big site and kind of move on. So would it be more thorough to do that way? Yeah, but it's kind of time consuming. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Susie, I missed your question here in the chat. I'll come back up to that. It says, how long do you think it's safe to go between search analysis and writing an article? If it's been, say, six weeks, should we take a look at the competition once again? Yes. Um, I, I, I think that that is smart. It's also good to kind of see how that how the search is changing over time. Is Google showing a different type of result here? Uh, for people looking for different kind of information as they get better at understanding search analysis. I will say this, one of the things that 
tipped me off that maybe we need to take a hard look at changing our search analysis process entirely from alphabet soup is the search analysis we did for the air gun site. So I'd wanted to create an air gun site uh, for a couple of years. And at one point I even did the search analysis and I had it saved in a Google doc. Then like a year later, and I used alphabet soup for that. Then a year later, I came back to that same search analysis and very little of that was showing in autocomplete. And I said, uh oh, there's been a significant shift in how autocomplete is working. And so um, anyway, so that, that was that was helpful for me to see how things had changed over time. And now in that case, it's just because Google was kind of deprecating the tool. Hi. Hi. Um, so previously when I was doing my um, search analysis and I'd find a query that I wanted to go after, um, I'd be looking at the SERP and the articles that were on there and their word count and how helpful they were in me deciding whether it was going to be a response staple or pillar. Are we saying that we need to do, do less of that now and just kind of base it on like how, how do we do it then if, if you're saying that you don't really need to look into each article which i wasn't i'd just be looking at the first few and i'd just see can i compete can i get to number one and that's what would give me that decision so how should i now approach it well i think another reason specifically for that is um we used to find a stronger correlation between the length of the article and how well it was going to rank i mean it used to be if you bang out 3000 words and just dominate this and it's 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 reasonably good you win it, it really did it felt that way at least um and now there's just hardly a correlation i i mean we all see really tiny posts all the time uh ranking ranking very high and so um, I think that's another reason why we don't necessarily need to click in. But if we are clicking in to read the article, my main question is just how well would this meet my needs as a searcher? Like, is this just an awesome resource? Is this exactly what I would want to find? Or do I read this and I'm left wanting? If I'm left wanting, then I'm going to throw my hat in the ring, see if I can do this better. And it's now it's more about being concise rather than the word count, right? When we're not really kind of looking at word count anymore. It's more about how helpful and how, how specific it is in answering the query. Yes. Yep. Thanks. Uh, Luke, I saw your uh, comment. It says, I just found SEMrush has a question section that will give you a ton of article ideas if you put in a base query. Would you recommend this just to get ideas? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and later in the course, I'm showing the same thing with Ahrefs. Ahrefs, SEMrush, I mean, they're both work very similarly. I do prefer Ahrefs myself. And so here we can go to Keywords Explorer. Uh, I've been searching, I don't know why I'm on Moza and Nagants this morning, but maybe we'll do something different. Uh, uh, college football. You're not sharing your screen, by the way. <laughs> Such an amateur. You forget, you get excited about search Such an analysis. amateur. It's like I've never been on Zoom before. This is like pre-COVID, it's looking like. Uh, so I just searched in Keywords Explorer College Football, and then I just come over here to questions with that root phrase. And once the spinny thing stops getting so dizzy, it's going to just show me question phrases. When does college football start, etc. These are all question question searches. That's great, Jim. Uh, Jim, we talked about uh, Wikipedia being a, you know, reasonable competitor, or at least in competition analysis. Uh, what about Pinterest? And what about, um, you know, EDU links, but linking to a PDF document? Do these count as a fairly good competition? Um, well, okay, so we'll, I'll take your last first. Um, I'm very frustrated with Google's last few algorithm updates. Ah, they've gotten just way too far. And you guys have probably seen this just as you've searched things. They've just gone too far with the, with the, uh, uh, with the authority, right? Sometimes I'll Google something like, um, you know, something like kind of medical or something like, uh, 
oh, I don't know, whatever, how to fix a hangnail. And it takes me to this white paper that's 40 pages long as a PDF from some college. And it's like, I do not want this, right? Like, yes, it's kind of medical, but can somebody just tell me what to do about my fingernail? I don't know if I need to read a study about it, right? And so we've all been seeing those popping up in the searches more recently. It's frustrating because those are a terrible user experience, but it just means Google's running around like a scared dog uh, and it just doesn't quite dare send this to somebody that may be giving misinformation. Um, and so anyway, but that, that, that one specifically, it's just frustrating. I feel like they're gonna sort this out going forward and we're gonna roll back a bit on that. Uh, but it, that one is frustrating. Now, Pinterest, when I see Pinterest ranking, well, first of all, Pinterest is getting suppressed hard in the rankings, hard. Uh, Google is so anti-competitive. Anytime they see somebody winning too much, they're like, not anymore. Um, and so you saw that query we did just a minute ago where they had this giant images block at the top and Pinterest is suddenly nowhere to be a found. You know, two years ago, Pinterest would have been the number one result for something like that. And Google has just decided, nah, we'll take the money. Um, and so if, you, if you're seeing Pinterest ranking though, it really just means that you need to share images. I'm just definitely going to do, you know, 21 gorgeous photos of whatever, of uh, Jeep, remod Jeep uh, modifications or something like that. Uh, I'm gonna focus my title and my content on the photos. In fact, you know, in cases like that, I don't really care if you put 21 big, beautiful photos with just a few sentences describing them in between and several paragraphs at the top. That's cool with me, it's fine. Thanks, Jim, that helps a lot. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I'm asking a little too many questions. I actually wrote one in the chat before and I think it got missed. So I'm just going to oh, read sorry, that out. If that's okay. uh, so basically I have this uh, new website that I've started. It is a little broad uh, in terms of the site name and site domain. And I plan to cover about six or seven subtopics on it. And I was just wondering, what I, should I you know, go ahead and write about 50, 60 articles in one subtopic altogether? Or do you think it's better to spread it out? I would spread it out. Um, and it's because we get a huge advantage once the articles start to take off to just have an idea, to get real numbers of how, ma of how many views they're bringing in per month. And so if you put all your eggs in one basket and we're just saying, hey, I'm going all in on running shoes. Well, what happens if, ah, man, it just wasn't quite what I expected. Turns out, you know, Google wanted to show more than just the product listings or whatever, right? And so, you know, don't don't throw spaghetti on the wall. It's it's good to do some amount of siloing, uh, but you got to be really confident in the silos you choose. And so, I would not go all in on one. I'd spread them out. I see Mark Danielle asks in the. Um, uh, oh, I guess I see two here. One from Vatsal Sharma says, while writing recipe content. Should we write long introductions regarding the recipe that includes information, or should I write a small intro followed by the recipe? <coughs> user experience. Uh, I mean, user experience is just all we care about. If it's better for you as a user to have the, the recipe high, and I think it is, then we should do that. If you can provide value in many paragraphs as well, great, do so. But the reason that we see the recipe buried so much on recipe blogs is not because that's uh, some kind of uh, winning recipe uh, to rank on Google. It's because they're trying to make money on ads is what has, has nothing to do with SEO. They just wanna keep you scrolling because every time you see an ad and it stays on your screen for 15 seconds, then they make an extra two cents. Um, so that's why that happens. Okay, Mark Danielle says, Jim, a question about post length. If I write a post about a subject and it takes 500 to 700 words to provide a complete answer um, that fulfills the reader's needs, should we add related questions to, to meet it up or is there no added value anymore in doing this? I, so this is a fascinating topic to me. Um, I have always felt like it should be possible to add a different type of post that's super short, 200 words, and just takes a smaller piece, right? This should work. 
Um, if we say, hey, we want to write one blog post that takes between two and four hours, and the goal is to get a thousand page views a month an article, well, why don't I just take smaller queries that each bring 30 uh, page views a month and just write a lot of those? I have tried it and I have tried it and I have never had success with that kind of strategy. And so I know that's not exactly what you're saying. You're saying going from 750 to whatever, a thousand. Um, and the reason I bring up that specific example is there is still just something about new websites writing really short content that Google just doesn't seem to love. Um, I, I see it all the time. You know, we'll see the spruce pets. We'll see simply recipes, all recipes, big sites. Somehow they get away with this 500 word stuff. I just have not seen success with a new site uh, writing that really short content. And so that's why we say a thousand on the response, 2000 plus on the staple. We just haven't yet seen a solid case study of somebody doing that and it working very well. Usually it ends up just looking too thin to Google. Uh, so Jim, so it's a question about authority. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, well, I think it maybe more has to do, well, Kind of, I, authority and links is really what, what I might say. Uh, it's just on the bigger sites, Google ten, tends to just give them a, a bigger shot, even though uh, the content maybe is pretty small and not, not super meaty. Um, they seem to give them a little bit better of a shot than they give a, new, a newer site. Oh, thanks. And a second question, uh, is there any added value from if I write an article and I place, uh, let's say I place a video, uh, of, or let's say I make a video for you for YouTube and then I transcribe it I make an article and I also I extract the the audio portion and I place everything on one side is there any added value on this uh, does it meet a searcher's needs better I mean so yes there is uh, more value if that video really is going to help them um, I really love and we've used on one of our sites um, we uh, it was just very visual in a lot of pieces. Let's say it was like a, you know, how to disassemble a vacuum or something like that. It's like, we can write a blog post on this, but everybody wants to see a video, right? And so we make the video, but we also would like a blog post. It's a big term, right? And so we made like short little video clips, 20 seconds, that kind of illustrated different portions of it. And then as you're reading the blog post, you could just watch that little video. And then we just made that video unlisted on YouTube because it doesn't, you know, we don't want to send that out to our, uh, our audience and stuff. So it, it can be great to help uh, meet someone's needs. Now you also mentioned transcribing. That's not something I would do. I mean, YouTube already knows what the words are in there. They're, they're doing a very good auto transcription. And usually when I've seen blog posts made directly out of a transcription, it's not good. It's just, you can tell like, this, this isn't how I would write this. Um, so probably not something I'd go crazy on. What we are doing um, I, on my YouTube video on Tuesday, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit, is we've made a bunch of videos for Backfire. Now of the 70 videos, maybe 24 of them, are suitable that the same topic could be a good blog post. And so I just make the video, I say everything I have to say, and then I send it to the writer and I say, hey, just take all the content from this, take screenshots from it to be your photos, everything. Don't transcribe this, but just write a helpful resource based on what I say. And it's cool because I can be the expert. They can write it in my name. They can still say something like when I tested this in the article, um, but I don't have to write both. I don't have to create that other format of content. Well, that's a great idea. I might implement this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, question regarding authority. Do you have articles on helping Google validate authority? <laughs> Okay, my wife and I are certified financial coaches. The reason I, I, I don't know what that sound was that I just made, but the reason I make that sound is, I don't know 
how Google does this. I don't know how Google decides what your authority is to write on a particular topic. So I used uh, in a YouTube video a couple months ago, the example of the site fuelingteens.com, fuelingteens.com. The site is my niece's site. Uh, she's in Project 24 and she says, hey, I wanna write a medical site about nutrition for kids and teenagers. And when I hear this, I was like, Catherine, do not do this. Stop. Don't do it. Like this is just way too, you, Google is going to freak out about this. It's about kids and health. You should not write this. And fortunately she ignored me. Um, now she is a nutritionist. And so, you know, I told her about YMYL and all this stuff. And she says, but I am a nutritionist. And I said, but how is Google going to know that, right? They're not going to like call your college and make sure that you actually got a degree. And so how is Google going to know this? Um, and sh she proceeded and the site has ranked incredibly well. She's beating 1000 page views per article per month by a good margin. It's like 1300 page views per article per month she's getting. And with like you know, whatever it is, 25 articles, she's getting like 30, 35,000 page views a month. That's really, really impressive, right? With a small site medical about kids to happen. And so I'm left just wondering, how did this occur, right? Is Google really just trolling through and saying, well, if I see the acronym DMD on an article and it's about dentists, I'm going to rank that one. That can't be, right? It can't be that they're just looking for that acronym. That's way too easy. People would just lie about it, um, right? Or, um, or ghostwrite it and ask a doctor's permission, right? Uh, so that they can ghostwrite in their name. It's just, there's no way that's the way it works. Um, and so Google saying, yeah, we, we care that you have the credentials, you're an expert, et cetera. But just in a practical sense, I can't imagine how that could really be true that they that they know uh, what our credentials are as some brand brand new blog. I've got to think they're just going off links and mentions. You know, this guy we could tell they've written a book. We could tell this person gets linked to a lot of times as an authority. We can tell that other uh, white papers cite this person as a source, things like that. And so. In my head, I've got to say, I don't care what your credential is. No, I don't care. That sounds rude. I don't mean it that way. I don't think it's going to make any difference for SEO, whether you have the credential as a certified financial planner or not. But then there are these case studies that I keep seeing that it makes me say, huh, maybe it does. So the answer to your question is, I don't know. But, that, that, but those, that's my thought process on the, on the, on the issue. Hey, I have a question. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's say uh, the question is about uh, content query group uh, staple posts. Mm -hmm. So let's say I write a post uh, where to find hummus in grocery store. Mm -hmm. And I write where to find hummus in Walmart, Target, all these uh, stores, right? Yep. And if it starts ranking, uh, Google will say, so if someone searches where to find hummus in Walmart, it will scroll down to that paragraph. Uh, user will read and bounce off. Mm -hmm. So I will have page views, but the uh, time uh, on the page will be very low. And if I'm trying to make money on display ads, I'm not sure it's going to help. So I'm not sure what's the, should yeah. I write at all? Very, very smart question. Um, I think a lot of us were concerned uh, when we saw that Google auto scrolling in our blog post uh, to the spot that it wants to send. And yet I haven't heard any on the ground actual results of, of ad revenue actually going down when that was implemented. And so I'm right there with you. I, that is a concern that I have, but I haven't actually heard of it of anybody seeing any change at the time. And so that's making me less concerned about it. I, I'm focused on, hey, let's get the page views and we're gonna do what we can about monetization later. Um, it, it, I, I'm not seeing red alert signs, at least in the industry. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Hey Jim, what about auto scrolling that Google is doing to cover a whole lot of subtopics in one article being more successful? Do you think that's a possibility? Like one I article that covers a bunch of subtopics? Yeah, I, I haven't yet seen any changes on the SERPs of Google just going to broad topics um, more regularly than they would have otherwise. So we'll take that, uh, we'll take the example that uh, Alish Sher said um, is, um, you know, where can I find hummus in the grocery store, right? So that's the more broad one. And then where can I find hummus in Walmart, Target, et cetera. And so um, I, there's always been a mix on the SERPs of sometimes Google's gonna show a more broad one. Sometimes it's going to show a more specific. Sometimes you'll write a more specific one and you're still going to get beat out by the more broad one, right? Um, I haven't seen any shifting in the SERPs over the last few months since auto scroll happened uh, because uh, Google is, you know, moving to just, just broad topics that it can auto scroll to. So far, the SERP seems to have stayed the same. We'll see what happens in the future. Great. Thank you. Hey, Jim, I wanted to ask about uh, staple posts. Um, normally, I write tons and tons of response posts. That's been my strategy. Um, but I, doing the new method, I'm getting mostly staple posts. Is that kind of the direction you want us to head? It is. Um, and that's, a, that's a one that we were nervous about doing, um, about moving more toward that staple post than the response, because when I talk to really successful members of Project 24, they're telling me all the time, I just write a lot of response posts. Um, and they write the other stuff too, but it's a lot of response posts. Um, and so I, I absolutely think that, that that can work very well. I, I, we have seen, however, a shift in semantic searches that, uh, that one post can now rank for a lot of different things. And so, you know, I just mentioned, I haven't seen a shift to more broad articles, but I have definitely uh, seen where Google is willing to, um, to, it's doing a better job at taking things that essentially are the same thing and showing that post, even if they're not using the same words, right? And so uh, that's one really strong case for shifting more toward those staple posts. The other thing is, um, as Google is getting better and better and wanting to show more and more authoritative um, sites, by us just having a higher crop of, 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 of articles on our websites, it helps everything. It attracts more links. Um, it gives uh, more opportunities for us to be seen in the industry when you're ranking for the bigger things. It just does a lot going after those, some, just, not a lot more competitive, but just moving up a little bit to a little bit more competitive of thing. And before we had to take a little bit of a spaghetti on the wall approach because uh, we didn't know at all what the search volume is. Now I'm feeling pretty confident. I, I feel like I'm, 80% confident that I'm at least categorizing things in the correct bucket of under 1,000, one to five, et cetera. I feel 80% confident that, that I'm getting those right, that it's at least in the right bucket. And so I don't need to throw spaghetti on the wall at any, anymore. Now I can have good confidence. And so if I know it's worth something, I'm gonna write something, an amazing resource. It's okay that it takes me a little bit more time because I know it's gonna be worth it. Whereas before, I, I really wasn't sure it was going to be worth it. We're coming up. Uh, well, I guess we've already passed a little bit of an hour here. Uh, I'll take maybe one more question here, and then we can sign off. Hey, Jim. Mm -hmm. I don't have a question, but I may never get a chance to actually talk face to face with you again. So I wanted to tell you I hit ninety five hundred dollars in April, and hey, I got, that's awesome. dude. I've got links coming in from Texas A&M, Stanford University, and uh, some local uh, .gov, uh, uh, city .gov. So I, I just thought that was really cool and wanted to share it. Hey, that's fantastic. What, what industry are you in? Uh, lawn and gardening. Lawn and garden. All right. Well, yeah. it's going to be a good summer for you then, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hey, congratulations. So, How old is the site? Thanks. 
it is, I guess it's a coming up on two years. Well, next June, I guess will be two years. And how many posts? Uh, 200 and over 200. I can't remember how, exactly. How many? Well, Pagey is hard to say was seasonal, but about what? Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, we weren't supposed to ask me any questions. <laughs> I only do, I only run my stats once a month. So I'm not really, I'm always focused on putting out, not so much on uh, hey, what we've got coming great. in. So. Well, that's good. Anyway, that, that's what it is. That's fantastic. Congratulations. So pretty, that's pretty a great. big deal. Are you full time? You, uh, I have two years till I can retire from my job. I've got a state job, so I'm going to, I'm going to bide my time, but you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. You're loaded, man. You got uh, a <laughs> state retirement plus now you got 94 yeah, man. Years coming in. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hey, barbecue at Paul's house guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks for sharing that. That's awesome. Yes, hey, sir. it was awesome talking with all you guys. Uh, I, I do just want to end on one note as anticipated. We, we, this is a big change in our search analysis process. Over the next couple months, we're going to tweak some things um, as we improve the teaching here. Uh, I really feel like we're headed in the right direction, uh, but based on all the questions we're getting, things like that, I mean, we're already making a cool addition to the search analysis tool that should be finished up today. Uh, by the way, you'll want to uh, copy and paste what you've done uh, into the new search analysis tool, the new new search analysis tool, not the one that came out last week. Uh, we've made some cool updates to it. Um, but also I can tell from a lot of your questions, things that just eh, weren't quite clear in the training or some negatives that people have brought up that we need to address and talk through. And so we're going to be adding a couple little lessons here and there over the next couple months to improve it. Um, you know, there are bumps, but I really do feel like this is the right direction to go. And we're going to be way more successful because of it. Um, but, uh, but anyway, I just wanted, wanted to let everybody know, if you're feeling uncomfortable, some parts of the process that aren't totally clear, that's to be expected. And now I mentioned the new, new search analysis tool. So I guess I'll just really quick share um, with you how that's working. Um, let's go. Yeah, the new, new search analysis tool. Okay, so right now, if you go to it, this is just the same one linked in the course. You can see it right now. Um, you'll see that it says currently updating to version two. Um, so we're working on this a little construction dust. Tomorrow, you should have the, the settled version. We're gonna call it version 2.1. So the only thing that changed on this page is when I set the search volume and competition, um, it, you know, we didn't change any data here for what it, what it determines as the priority, but we added some colors so that you can see, um, just quickly see uh, what your priority should be uh, for writing this article. And it's just saying, no, it's, it's just gonna be color coded from dark green to red, uh, just so you can quickly scan which are your uh, low hanging fruit to write about. So that's change one. Change two, we added this tool called the Partial Search Assistant. Uh, there was an idea from a member, a really cool idea. So let's say, I write about something like, uh, oh, let's call it whatever. Um, college football is my niche. And then it's just going to hear, these are all the partial searches and it's just adding my search phrase in there. So now I can just copy and paste this over and over again, copy and paste, copy and paste, copy and paste into Google to be doing those, those partial searches. So we don't even have to use our brain, just go down this list. And then down here, it's like a, a person involved in your niche. And so I might say something like, a, oh, whatever, a, a, what do you call a haberdasher? <laughs> I don't know. It seems like a funny word, a haberdasher. Um, and so now I come down here and why do, I should have put the S, why do haberdashers are haberdashers, how many haberdashers, etc. So it's just helping me uh, to think of those ideas to do those partial searches uh, and different ways that I can phrase that question. So that's the second thing. Third thing we added is just this for Content Warrior employees only. This is just if you happen to be ordering from Content Warrior, 
Uh, it's going to help us with some internal stuff on your order. So we just decided to put it in there. It's its own sheet, so it won't bug you if you're not using Content Warrior at all. Anyway, that's what's uh, happening with the, the new, new search analysis tool. Should be done probably by the end of the day. We'll have it ready. Hey, thanks, everybody. Really fun to see your faces and chat with you guys. I uh, look forward to seeing you in my next office hours.